Chapter forty four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Twenty Years After by Alexander Dumas. Chapter forty four. To Deum for the Victory of Lons. The bustle which had been observed by Henrietta Maria, and for which she had vainly sought to discover a reason, was occasioned by the Battle of Lons, announced by the prince's messenger, the Duc de Chataillon, who had taken such a noble part in the engagement. He was, besides, charged to hang five-and-twenty flags, taken from the Lorraine party, as well as from the Spaniards, upon the arches of Notre Dame. Such news was decisive. It destroyed, in favor of the court, the struggle commenced with Parliament. The motive given for all the taxes summarily imposed, and to which the Parliament had made opposition, was the necessity of sustaining the honor of France, and the uncertain hope of beating the enemy. Now, since the affair of Nordlingen, they had experienced nothing but reverses. The Parliament had a plea for calling Mazarin to account for imaginary victories, always promised, ever deferred. But this time there really had been fighting, a triumph, and a complete one and this all knew so well that it was a double victory for the court, a victory at home and abroad, so that even when the young king learned the news he exclaimed, Ah, gentlemen of the Parliament, we shall see what you will say now. Upon which the queen had pressed the royal child to her heart, whose haughty and unruly sentiments were in such harmony with her own. A council was called on the same evening, but nothing transpired of what had been decided on. It was only known that on the following Sunday, a Te Deum would be sung at Notre Dame in honor of the victory of Lons. The following Sunday, then, the Parisians awoke with joy. At that period, a Te Deum was a grand affair. This kind of ceremony had not then been abused, and it produced a great effect. The shops were deserted, houses closed, everyone wished to see the young king with his mother, and the famous Cardinal Mazarin, whom they hated so much that no one wished to be deprived of his presence. Moreover, great liberty prevailed throughout the immense crowd, every opinion was openly expressed and chorused so to speak of coming insurrection as the thousand bells of all the paris churches rang out the te deum the police belonging to the city being formed by the city itself nothing threatening presented itself to disturb this concert of universal hatred or freeze the frequent scoffs of slanderous lips nevertheless at eight o'clock in the morning the regiment of the queen's guards commanded by guiton under whom was his nephew Comminges, marched publicly, preceded by drums and trumpets, filing off from the Palais Royal as far as Notre Dame, a maneuver which the Parisians witnessed tranquilly, delighted as they were with military music and brilliant uniforms. Friquet had put on his Sunday clothes, under the pretext of having a swollen face, which he managed to simulate by introducing a handful of cherry kernels into one side of his mouth, and had procured a whole holiday from Bazin. On leaving Bazin, Friquet started off to the Palais Royal, where he arrived at the moment of the turning out of the regiment of guards, and as he had only gone there for the enjoyment of seeing it and hearing the music, he took his place at their head, beating the drum on two pieces of slate, and passing from that exercise to that of the trumpet, which he counterfeited quite naturally with his mouth, in a manner which had more than once called forth the praises of amateurs of imitative harmony. This amusement lasted from the Barriere des Sergents to the place of Notre Dame, and Friquet found in it real enjoyment, but when at last the regiment separated, penetrated the heart of the city, and placed itself at the extremity of the Rue Saint-Christophe, near the Rue Cocatrix, in which Bruxelles lived, then Friquet remembered that he had not had breakfast, and after thinking in which direction he had better turn his steps in order to accomplish this important act of the day, he reflected deeply and decided that Councillor Bruxelles should bear the cost of this repast. In consequence, he took to his heels, arrived breathlessly at the Councillor's door, and knocked violently. His mother, the councillor's old servant, opened it. "'What doest thou here, good for nothing?' she said. "'And why art thou not at Notre Dame?' "'I have been there, mother,' said Friquet. "'But I saw things happen of which Master Broussel ought to be warned. "'And so, with Monsieur Bazin's permission, "'you know, mother, Monsieur Bazin the verger, "'I came to speak to Monsieur Broussel. "'And what have you to say, boy, to Monsieur Broussel?' "'I wish to tell him,' replied Friquet, screaming with all his might, "'that there is a whole regiment of guards coming this way, "'and as I hear everywhere that at the court they are ill-disposed to him, "'I wish to warn him that he may be on his guard.' 
Brussel heard the scream of the young oddity, and, enchanted with his excess of zeal, came down to the first floor, for he was, in truth, working in his room on the second. "'Well,' said he, "'friend, what matters the regiment of guards to us, and art thou not mad to make such a disturbance? Knowest thou not that it is the custom of these soldiers to act thus, and that it is usual for the regiment to form themselves into two solid walls when the king goes by?' Friquet counterfeited surprise, and, twisting his new cap around in his finger, said, "'It is not astonishing for you to know it, Monsieur Broussel, who knows everything. But as for me, by holy truth, I did not know it, and I thought I would give you good advice. You must not be angry with me for that, Monsieur Broussel.' "'On the contrary, my boy, on the contrary, I am pleased with your zeal. Dame Nanette, look for those apricots which Madame de Longueville sent to us yesterday from Noisy, and give half a dozen of them to your son, with a crust of new bread. "'Oh, thank you, sir, thank you, Monsieur Broussel,' said Friquet. "'I am so fond of apricots.' Broussel then proceeded to his wife's room, and asked for breakfast. It was nine o'clock. The councillor placed himself at the window. The street was completely deserted, but in the distance was heard, like the noise of the tide rushing in, the deep hum of the populous waves increasing now around Notre Dame. This noise redoubled when D'Artagnan, with a company of musketeers, placed himself at the gates of Notre Dame to secure the service of the church. He had instructed Porthos to profit by this opportunity to see the ceremony, and Porthos, in full dress, mounted his finest horse, taking the part of supernumerary musketeer, as D'Artagnan had so often done formerly. The sergeant of this company, a veteran of the Spanish wars, had recognized Porthos, his old companion, and very soon all those who served under him were placed in possession of startling facts concerning the honor of the ancient musketeers of Treville. Porthos had not only been well received by the company, but he was moreover looked on with great admiration. At ten o'clock the guns of the Louvre announced the departure of the king, and then a movement, similar to that of trees in a stormy wind that bend and writhe with agitated tops, ran through the multitude, which was compressed behind the immovable muskets of the guard. At last the king appeared with the queen in a gilded chariot. Ten other carriages followed, containing the ladies of honor, the officers of the royal household, and the court. "'God save the king!' was the cry in every direction. The young monarch gravely put his head out of the window, looked sufficiently grateful, and even bowed, at which the cries of the multitude were renewed. Just as the court was settling down in the cathedral, a carriage, bearing the arms of Comminges, quitted the line of the court carriages, and proceeded slowly to the end of the Rue Saint-Christophe, now entirely deserted. When it arrived there, four guards and a police officer, who accompanied it, mounted into the heavy machine, and closed the shutters. Then, through an opening cautiously made, the policeman began to watch the length of the Rue Cocatrix, as if he was waiting for someone. All the world was occupied with the ceremony, so that neither the chariot nor the precautions taken by those who were within it had been observed. Friquet, whose eye ever on the alert could alone have discovered them, had gone to devour his apricots upon an entablature of a house in the square of Notre Dame. Thence he saw the king, the queen, and Monsieur Mazarin, and heard the mass as well as if he had been on duty. Toward the end of the service, the queen, seeing Comminges standing near her, waiting for a confirmation of the order she had given him before quitting the Louvre, said in a whisper, "'Go, Comminges, and may God aid you.' Comminges immediately left the church, and entered the Rue Saint-Christophe. Friquet, seeing this fine officer thus walk away, followed by two guards, amused himself by pursuing them, and did this so much the more gladly, as the ceremony ended at that instant, and the king remounted his carriage." Hardly had the police officer observed Comminges at the end of the Rue Cocatrix, when he said one word to the coachman, who at once put his vehicle into motion, and drove up before Broussel's door. Comminges knocked at the door at the same moment, and Friquet was waiting behind Comminges until the door should be opened. "'What dost thou there, rascal?' asked Comminges. "'I want to go into Master Broussel's house, Captain,' replied Friquet, in that wheedling way the gamins of Paris know so well how to assume when necessary." "'And on what floor does he live?' asked Comminges. "'In the whole house,' said Friquet. "'The house belongs to him. "'He occupies the second floor when he works, "'and descends to the first to take his meals. "'He must be at dinner now. "'It is noon.' "'Good,' said Comminges. "'At this moment the door was opened, "'and having questioned the servant, "'the officer learned that Master Broussel was at home and at dinner. 
Purcell was seated at the table with his family, having his wife opposite to him, his two daughters by his side, and his son, Louvier, whom we have already seen when the accident happened to the counsellor, an accident from which he had quite recovered, at the bottom of the table. The worthy man, restored to perfect health, was tasting the fine fruit which Madame de Longueville had sent to him. At sight of the officer, Broussel was somewhat moved, but seeing him bow politely, he rose and bowed also. Still, in spite of this reciprocal politeness, the countenances of the women betrayed a certain amount of uneasiness. Louvier became very pale, and waited impatiently for the officer to explain himself. "'Sir,' said Comiche, "'I am the bearer of an order from the king.' "'Very well, sir,' replied Broussel. "'What is this order?' and he held out his hand. "'I am commissioned to seize your person, sir,' said Comiche, in the same tone and with the same politeness, "'and if you will believe me, you had better spare yourself the trouble of reading that long letter, and follow me.' A thunderbolt falling in the midst of these good people, so peacefully assembled there, would not have produced a more appalling effect. It was a horrible thing at that period to be imprisoned by the enmity of the king. Louvier sprang forward to snatch his sword, which stood against a chair in the corner of the room. But a glance from the worthy Broussel, who in the midst of it all did not lose his presence of mind, checked this foolhardy action of despair. Madame Broussel, separated by the width of the table from her husband, burst into tears, and the young girls clung to their father's arms. "'Come, sir,' said Comige, "'make haste. You must obey the king.' "'Sir,' said Broussel, "'I am in bad health, and cannot give myself up a prisoner in this state. I must have time.' "'It is impossible,' said Comiche. "'The order is strict, and must be put into execution this instant.' "'Impossible,' said Louvier. "'Sir, beware of driving us to despair.' "'Impossible!' cried a shrill voice from the end of the room. Comiche turned, and saw Dame Nanette, her eyes flashing with anger and a broom in her hand. "'My good Nanette, be quiet, I beseech you,' said Broussel. "'Me? Keep quiet while my master is being arrested? He, the support, the liberator, the father of the people? Ah, well, yes, you have to know me yet. Are you going?' added she to Comiche. The latter smiled. "'Come, sir,' said he, addressing Broussel, "'silence that woman and follow me.' "'Silence me? Me? Me?' said Nanette. "'Ah, yet one wants someone beside you for that, my fine king's cockatoo. You shall see.' And Dame Nanette sprang to the window, threw it open, and in such a piercing voice that it might have been heard in the square of Notre Dame. "'Help!' she screamed. "'My master is being arrested! The Councillor Broussel is being arrested! Help!' sir said comiche declare yourself at once will you obey or do you intend to rebel against the king i obey i obey sir cried broussel trying to disengage himself from the grasp of his two daughters and by a look restrain his son who seemed determined to dispute authority in that case commanded comiche silence that old woman ah old woman screamed nanette and she began to shriek more loudly clinging to the bars of the window help help for master broussel who is arrested because he has defended the people help comiche seized the servant around the waist and would have dragged her from her post but at that instant a treble voice proceeding from a kind of entresol was heard screeching murder fire assassins master broussel is being killed master broussel is being strangled it was friquet's voice and dame nanette feeling herself supported recommenced with all her strength to sound her silly squawk Many curious faces had already appeared at the windows, and the people attracted to the end of the street began to run, first men, then groups, and then a crowd of people, hearing cries and seeing a chariot that could not understand it, but Friquet sprang from the entresol on to the top of the carriage. "'They want to arrest Master Broussel,' he cried. "'The guards are in the carriage, and the officer is upstairs.' The crowd began to murmur and approached the house. The two guards who had remained in the lane mounted to the aid of Comiche, those who were in the chariot opened the doors and presented arms. "'Don't you see them?' said Friquet. "'Don't you see? There they are!' The coachman, turning around, gave Friquet a slash with his whip, which made him scream with pain. "'Ah, devil's coachman!' cried Friquet. "'You are meddling, too. Wait!' And regaining his entresol, he overwhelmed the coachman with every projectile he could lay hands on. The tumult now began to increase. The street was not able to contain the spectators who assembled from every direction. The crowd invaded the space which the dreaded pikes of the guards had till then kept clear between them and the carriage. The soldiers, pushed back by these living walls, were in danger of being crushed against the spokes of the wheels and the panels of the carriages. 
the cries which the police officer repeated twenty times in the king's name were powerless against this formidable multitude it seemed on the contrary to exasperate it still more when at the shout in the name of the king an officer ran up and seeing the uniforms ill-treated he sprang into the scuffle sword in hand and brought unexpected help to the guards this gentleman was a young man scarcely sixteen years of age now white with anger he leaped from his charger placed his back against the shaft of the carriage making a rampart of his horse drew his pistols from their holsters and fastened them to his belt and began to fight with the back sword like a man accustomed to the handling of his weapon during ten minutes he alone kept the crowd at bay at last comminges appeared pushing Bruxelles before him let us break the carriage cried the people in the king's name cried comminges the first who advances is a dead man cried raoul for it was in fact he who feeling himself pressed and almost crushed by a gigantic citizen pricked him with the point of his sword and sent him howling back comminges so to speak threw Bruxelles into the carriage and sprang in after him at this moment a shot was fired and a ball passed through the hat of comminges and broke the arm of one of the guards Comminges looked up and saw amidst the smoke the threatening face of Louvier appearing at the window of the second floor. "'Very well, sir,' said Comminges. "'You shall hear of this anon.' "'And you of me, sir,' said Louvier. "'And we shall see then who can speak the loudest.' Friquet and Nanette continued to shout. The cries, the noise of the shot, and the intoxicating smell of powder produced their usual maddening effects. "'Down with the officer! Down with him!' was the cry. "'One step nearer,' said Comminges putting down the sashes that the interior of the carriage might be well seen, and placing his sword on his prisoner's breast. One step nearer, and I kill the prisoner. My orders were to carry him off alive or dead. I will take him dead, that's all. A terrible cry was heard, and the wife and daughters of Bruxelles held up their hands in supplication to the people. The latter knew that this officer, who was so pale, but who appeared so determined, would keep his word. They continued to threaten, but they began to disperse drive to the palace said comminges to the coachman who was by then more dead than alive the man whipped his animals which cleared away through the crowd but on arriving on the quay they were obliged to stop the carriage was upset the horses carried off stifled mangled by the crowd raoul on foot for he had not had time to mount his horse again tired like the guards of distributing blows with the flat of his sword had recourse to its point but this last and dreaded resource served only to exasperate the multitude from time to time a shot from a musket or the blade of a rapier flashed among the crowd. Projectiles continued to hail down from the windows, and some shots were heard, the echo of which, though they were probably fired in the air, made all hearts vibrate. Voices, unheard except on days of revolution, were distinguished. Faces were seen that only appeared on days of bloodshed. Cries of death, death to the guards, to the sin with the officer, were heard above all the noise, deafening as it was. Raoul, his hat in ribbons, his face bleeding, felt not only his strength but also his reason going. A red mist covered his sight, and through this mist he saw a hundred threatening arms stretched over him, ready to seize upon him when he fell. The guards were unable to help any one. Each one was occupied with his self-preservation. All was over. Carriages, horses, guards, and perhaps even the prisoner were about to be torn to shreds, when all at once a voice well known to Raoul was heard, and suddenly a great sword glittered in the air. At the same time the crowd opened, upset, trodden down, and an officer of the musketeers, striking and cutting right and left, rushed up to Raoul and took him in his arms just as he was about to fall. "'God's blood!' cried the officer. "'Have they killed him? Woe to them if it be so!' And he turned around, so stern with anger, strength, and threat, that the most excited rebels hustled back on one another in order to escape, and some of them even rolled into the Seine. Monsieur d'Artagnan, murmured Raoul. Yes, Sedeth, in person. Unfortunately, it seems for you, my young friend. Come on, hear you others, he continued, rising in his stirrups, raising his sword, and addressing those musketeers who had not been able to follow his rapid onslaught. Come, sweep away all that for me. Shoulder muskets. Present arms. Aim. At this command, the mountain of populace thinned so suddenly that d'Artagnan could not repress a burst of Homeric laughter. "'Thank you, D'Artagnan,' said Comminges, showing half his body through the window of the broken vehicle. "'Thanks, my young friend. Your name, that I may mention it to the Queen.' Raoul was about to reply when D'Artagnan bent down to his ear. "'Hold your tongue,' said he, "'and let me answer. 
"'Do not lose time, Comines,' she continued. "'Get out of the carriage, if you can, and make another draw up. "'Be quick, or in five minutes the mob will be on us again "'with swords and muskets, and you will be killed. "'Hold! There is a carriage coming over yonder.' Then, bending again to Raoul, he whispered, "'Above all things, do not divulge your name.' "'That's right. I will go,' said Comminges, "'and if they come back, fire.' "'Not at all. Not at all,' replied D'Artagnan. "'Let no one move. On the contrary, one shot at this moment would be paid for dearly to-morrow.' Comminges took his four guards and as many musketeers, and ran to the carriage, from which he made the people inside dismount, and brought them to the vehicle which had upset but when it was necessary to convey the prisoner from one carriage to the other, the people, catching sight of him whom they called their liberator, uttered every imaginable cry and nodded themselves once more around the vehicle. "'Start! Start!' said D'Artagnan. "'There are ten men to accompany you. I will keep twenty to hold and check the mob. Go, and lose not a moment. Ten men for Monsieur de Comminges!' As the carriage started off, the cries were redoubled and more than ten thousand people thronged the quay and overflowed the pont neuf and adjacent streets a few shots were fired and one musketeer was wounded forward cried d'artagnan driven to extremities biting his moustache and then he charged with his twenty men and dispersed them in fear one man alone remained in his place gun in hand ah he exclaimed is it thou who was to have him assassinated wait an instant and he pointed his gun at d'artagnan who was riding toward him at full speed d'artagnan bent down to his horse's neck the young man fired and the ball severed the feathers from the hat the horse started brushed against the imprudent man who thought by his strength alone to stay the tempest and he fell against the wall d'artagnan pulled up his horse and while his musketeers continued to charge he returned and bent with drawn sword over the man he had knocked down oh sir exclaimed raoul recognizing the young man as having seen him in the rue cockatrix spare him it is his son d'artagnan's arm dropped to his side ah you are his son he said that is a different thing sir i surrender said louvier presenting his unloaded musket to the officer eh hey, no do not suffer egad on the contrary be off and quickly if i take you you will be hung the young man did not wait to be told twice, but passing under the horse's head, disappeared at the corner of the Rue Gunigaud. If faith, said D'Artagnan to Raoul, you were just in time to stay my hand. He was a dead man, and on my honor, if I had discovered that it was his son, I should have regretted having killed him. Ah, sir, said Raoul, allow me, after thanking you for that poor fellow's life, to thank you on my own account. I, too, sir, was almost dead when you arrived wait wait young man do not fatigue yourself with speaking we can talk of it afterward then seeing that the musketeers had cleared the quay from the pont neuf to the quay saint michel he raised his sword for them to double their speed the musketeers trotted up and at the same time the ten men whom d'artagnan had given to comminges appeared halloo cried d'artagnan has something fresh happened eh hey, sir replied the sergeant their vehicle is broken down a second time it really must be doomed they are bad managers said d'artagnan shrugging his shoulders when a carriage is chosen it ought to be strong the carriage in which a Bruxelles is to be arrested ought to be able to bear ten thousand men what are your commands lieutenant take the detachment and conduct him to his place but you will be left alone certainly so you suppose i have need of an escort go the musketeers set off and d'artagnan was left alone with raoul now he said are you in pain yes my head is not only swimming but burning what's the matter with this head said d'artagnan raising the battered hat ah ah a bruise yes i think i received a flower-pot upon my head brutes said d'artagnan but were you not on horseback you have spurs yes but i got down to defend monsieur de comminges and my horse was taken away here it is i see at this very moment friquet passed mounted on raoul's horse waving his party-colored cap and crying broussel broussel halloo stop rascal cried d'artagnan bring hither that horse friquet heard perfectly but he pretended not to do so and tried to continue his road d'artagnan felt inclined for an instant to pursue master friquet but not wishing to leave raoul alone he contented himself with taking a pistol from the holster and cocking it friquet had a quick eye and a fine ear he saw d'artagnan's movement heard the sound of the click and stopped at once 
"'Ah, it is you, Your Honour,' he said, advancing toward D'Artagnan, "'and I am truly pleased to meet you.' D'Artagnan looked attentively at Friquet, and recognized the little chorister of the Rue de la Calandre. "'Ah, tis thou, rascal,' said he. "'Come here, so thou hast changed thy trade. Thou art no longer a choir-boy nor a tavern-boy. Thou hast become a horse-stealer?' "'Ah, oh, Your Honour, how can you say so?' exclaimed Friquet. "'I was seeking the gentleman to whom this horse belongs, "'an officer, brave and handsome as the youthful Caesar. "'Then, pretending to see Raoul for the first time, "'Ah, but if I mistake not,' continued he, "'here he is. You won't forget the boy, sir.' "'Raoul put his hand in his pocket. "'What are you about?' asked D'Artagnan. "'To give ten francs to this honest fellow,' replied Raoul, "'taking a pistol from his pocket.' Ting kicks on his back, said D'Artagnan. Be off, you little villain, and forget not that I have your address. Friquet, who did not expect to be let off so cheaply, bounded off like a gazelle up the Quai de la Rue Dauphine, and disappeared. Raoul mounted his horse, and both leisurely took their way to the Rue Tiquetonne. D'Artagnan watched over the youth as if he had been his own son. They arrived without accident at the Hôtel de la Chavrette. The handsome Madeleine announced to D'Artagnan that Planchette had returned, bringing Mousqueton with him, who had heroically borne the extraction of the ball, and was as well as his state would permit. D'Artagnan desired Planchette to be summoned, but he had disappeared. "'Then bring some wine,' said D'Artagnan. "'You are much pleased with yourself,' said he to Raoul, when they were alone, are you not?' "'Well, yes,' replied Raoul. "'It seems to me I did my duty. I defended the king.' "'And who told you to defend the king?' "'The Comte de la Fere himself.' yes the king but to-day you have not fought for the king you have fought for mazarin which is not quite the same thing but you yourself oh for me that is another matter i obey my captain's orders as for you your captain is the prince understand that rightly you have no other but has one ever seen such a wild fellow continued he making himself a mazarinist and helping to arrest Bruxelles? breathe not a word of that or the Comte de la Fere will be furious. You think the Count will be angry with me? Think it, I am certain of it. Were it not for that, I should thank you, for you have worked for us. However, I scold you instead of him, and in his place the storm will blow over more easily, believe me. And moreover, my dear child, continued D'Artagnan, I am making use of the privilege conceded to me by your guardian. I do not understand you, sir, said Raoul. D'Artagnan rose, and taking a letter from his writing-desk, presented it to Raoul. The face of the latter became serious when he had cast his eyes upon the paper. "'Oh, mon Dieu!' he said, raising his fine eyes to D'Artagnan, moist with tears. "'The Count has left Paris without seeing me?' "'He left four days ago,' said D'Artagnan. "'But this letter seems to intimate that he is about to incur danger, perhaps death. "'He—he he, incur danger of death?' no be not anxious he is travelling on business and will return ere long i hope you have no repugnance to accept me as your guardian in the interim oh no monsieur d'artagnan said raoul you are such a brave gentleman and the comte de la fere has so much affection for you ah egad love me too i will not torment you much but only on condition that you become a frondist my young man and a hearty frondist too but can i continue to visit madame de chevreuse I should say you could, and the coadjutor, and Madame de Longueville, and if the worthy Broussel were there, whom you so stupidly helped arrest, I should tell you to excuse yourself to him at once and kiss him on both cheeks. Well, sir, I will obey you, although I do not understand you. It is unnecessary for you to understand. Hold, continued D'Artagnan, turning toward the door which had just opened. Here is Monsieur de Voilon, who comes with his coat torn. Yes but in exchange said porthos covered with perspiration and soiled by dust in exchange i have torn many skins those wretches wanted to take away my sword deuce take em what a popular commotion continued the giant in his quiet manner but i knocked down more than twenty with the hilt of balazard a draught of wine d'artagnan oh i'll answer for you said the garçon filling porthos's glass to the brim but when you have drunk give me your opinion upon what said porthos Look here, resumed D'Artagnan, here is Monsieur de Bragelonne, who determined at all risks to aid the arrest of Broussel, and whom I had great difficulty to prevent defending Monsieur de Comminges. The devil, said Porthos, and his guardian? What would he have said to that? 
do you hear interrupted d'artagnan become a frondist my friend belong to the fronde and remember that i fill the count's place in everything and he jingled his money will you come said he to porthos where asked porthos filling a second glass of wine to present our respects to the cardinal porthos swallowed the second glass with the same grace with which he had imbibed the first took his beaver and followed d'artagnan as for raoul he remained bewildered with what he had seen having been forbidden by d'artagnan to leave the room until the tumult was over End of chapter forty four